Hello everyone and welcome to the Mile End Institute at Queen Mary University of London. My name is Patrick Diamond and I'm director of the Mile End Institute and I'm delighted to welcome you for this event this evening. Uh, as you'll know, this event is bringing together a panel of experts, uh, pollsters, politicians, commentators to discuss Keir Starmer's first year as leader of the opposition in the aftermath of what have been major elections that have taken place across much of England, Scotland and Wales. So we're going to start this evening's event with a presentation by Anthony Wells, who's Director of Political and Social Research at YouGov, that's going to give us some insight into what the polls say about Keir Starmer and Labour's performance over the past year and the present and future challenges which face the Labour leadership. Our panel is then going to address how it believes the party is performing under Starmer's leadership and what a tumultuous 72 hours for the Labour Party it's been. So much to reflect on, so much to think about, so much to consider. But some of the questions we'll examine are, why are voters not yet persuaded they should return to Labour after a heavy defeat in the general election of 2019? Why is Labour performing so poorly in the so-called red wall seats in the north of England and the Midlands? Does Labour have too much to say about policy or too little? Does Labour need to confront the issue of Brexit more directly? How effective has the party been at exposing the perceived weaknesses of the government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic? And finally, is Labour in its present state in any way capable of winning the battle of ideas in British politics? These are some of the questions we want to consider, and I'll turn to our panellists in a moment and ask each of them to give some introductory remarks. But before we move to that discussion, um, I'm going to turn to Anthony. I should also say that if you have questions or comments, please use the chat box or the Q&A function, and we'll be monitoring these throughout the event. You can also tweet your question using the hashtag MEI Starmer's First Year. We'd love to hear um, any comments or questions that you'd like to put to the panel, so please um, do keep those coming in. So without any further ado, let me hand over to uh, Anthony Wells from YouGov for his opening presentation. Anthony. Thanks, Patrick. Um, just bring that up. Um, I'm going to start as your as pollsters always, always start with them. Um, first, I'm going to start with trying to work out how to move onwards on this thing. Um, 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 right, as a pollster, I'm almost obliged to start with the voting intention figures. Um, um, this is, you'll have seen a million times and you'll be very familiar with. Um, uh, let me just stick up the, the key points on there. Um, um, Keir Starmer obviously inherited not just an awful Labour defeat, but also an awful position in the polls. He started out about 20 points behind a Conservative Party. At the time, obviously, it was a Conservative Party leader who was intensive care or recently out of intensive care which flattered his position but nevertheless he started out 20 points behind and to give him credit he closed that within his first six months he took a party that was 20 points behind in the polls to a party that was neck and neck and we shouldn't given Labour's current position we shouldn't forget that actually his strong his initial period was very very strong he closed that down like that it only opened up again and we got to the third lockdown and more importantly at the same time the vaccination rollout began and that's the point when Keir Starmer's figures have started to go and the Labour Party's figures have all started to go the wrong way. A very similar thing uh, yesterday you can look at and I, I, people might well look at where the Labour have done well or badly the most neutral figures to probably look at as a broad overview are the the projected vote shares so from the BBC and from um, um, Colin and Michael in terms of they give the Conservative Party a 10 point lead and a, and a seven point lead, um, um, which is from where we are. This is a, a Conservative government, it's 11, 11th year. These are on the face of it terrible figures for Labour. And so over the weekend, we got all those questions about why Labour are doing so badly, what could Labour have done right, what could Labour have done better, why? Um, and my first thought is almost to remember that elections are a zero-sum game. 
those aren't necessarily the questions to ask. And maybe to some degree, we should have been asking instead, um, um, why are the Conservative Party doing so incredibly well? Why are they, why were they, why is it success for them? This is not necessarily all down to Labour or down to Keir Starmer. Um, um, maybe it's that there's a Conservative government that stood on delivering Brexit and did it, and that is in the middle of a pandemic and is in the middle of a vaccine rollout where they've got 80 to 90% approval. Um, um, maybe the question is, how exactly does a Labour Party hope to compete against that? Um, uh, nevertheless, the, today we're here to discuss Keir Starmer. So to actually look at that, we need to look past voting intentions and comparative things and look at what people actually say about Keir Starmer and Labour. Here's Keir Starmer's own ratings and whether people think he's doing good or bad as leader. Um, um, all these get a bit of a honeymoon when we ask this because basically people are open-minded. Most of the time when you come and you're the leader of the opposition, most of the public have no idea who you are and know nothing whatsoever about you. And most people are open-minded and want to give you a chance. But nevertheless, he kept, he started with positive figures and he kept them through all the way to January. Again, it's only when it got to the vaccine rollout that things actually started going badly. And ultimately that's, his job is to criticize the government. And if your job's to criticize the government and the government on the thing they're doing have an approval rating, this is from last week, the government had an approval rating of 88% on the only thing that people care about. Um, uh, I don't know how people's Zooms are, but if I'm blocking everyone's views, so, but on that, what are you supposed to do? You end up with a position where people think when you're doing your job, you're just being critical, you're being nasty. Um, um, we haven't got, I don't do focus groups, I'm, I'm a quant researcher, um, um, but I'm, uh, I was hoping we would have Deborah Madison tonight to ask her what you've got in her focus groups on this. But certainly anecdotally, the thing I always hear when I talk to people about Keir Starmer is, now, why is that man picking fault? Why well, he's always got something negative to say, he never has anything nice. You know, it's always, you don't normally get that about a government, but people like to pick fault about a government. When a government's got, 88% approval rating on something, it's rather different. Let's go, these are go, uh, exactly what people think of Keir Starmer. These are questions we ask every two months or so, and we say, you know, is Keir Starmer decisive or indecisive? Is he competent or incompetent? And, so on. and it brings out their strengths and weaknesses. And you can see here, he's not seen as a trustworthy man, particularly. He's not seen it, but where he does score very highly is competent. Right out of the bat, people looked at this man and saw there's someone who looks competent and capable. That's still, even now, with these reduced ratings, that's the one thing where he scores very, very well. And I'd argue, as we're going to look on to the next slide, given Labour's weaknesses, that's exactly what Labour needs. They need someone there who exudes competence and ability, someone who could go there and be a prime minister and look like a leader. If a move on, this is almost the same questions we ask about the Labour Party every two months. And we say, is the Labour Party moderate or extreme, competent, incompetent, and so on. And again, you can look down there and see their strengths and weaknesses. And ultimately, go back to when the Conservatives were mired in opposition, it was always their problem was they're a nasty party. The Labour Party don't have that problem. People still look at the Labour Party, I mean, they care. They care about ordinary people. They're trying to do the right thing, they're not out for themselves. On that front, Labour, the, Labour still has a lot of brand strength. These are people who people trust to do the right thing. Their problem is incompetence, disunity, weakness. They're not ready for government. That's where Labour's core problems of their brand lie. Um, but we've been asking this for a while. These are the same questions when we asked them in October 2019. This is the last time we asked them before in Jeremy Corbyn's before the, the general election. So it's the last proper one under Jeremy Corbyn. And on everywhere, Keir Starmer as leader has transformed the position of the Labour Party for the better. So yes, they're still seen as not competent, but they're seen as an awfully lot more competent than they once were. And ditto all the way down. Keir Starmer has really made genuine progress in how the Labour Party is seen. So, as over, overhaul, they're up against 
the biggest problem ultimately is they're up against a government that's delivering on their promises and has very, very positive ratings on the main issue of the day. The initial perceptions of Starmer were positive, but they really have started to go downhill and tire as, as, as the vaccine rollout goes ahead. Whether that's, it's almost that he's, because he hasn't done enough, his opponents are starting to characterise him in the eyes of the public. But that's not too late for him to turn that around. Labour's brand still has real genuine strengths. There's things there the Conservatives would kill for in terms of being seen as caring, but incompetent and not fit for government. But direction of travel is in the right direction. And ultimately, as I'm sure everyone else is going to explore, they are an incredibly low position. They've yeah, got a really, really huge gap to make up if they want to get near winning the next election. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, lots of food for thought there. Um, in some ways, if you're a supporter of the Labour Party, some quite depressing findings, but perhaps also um, perhaps a, a little scope for optimism in the data and numbers that you were showing us there. So we're now going to turn to our really excellent panel for a discussion of what we heard from Anthony, but also a wider discussion about Keir Starmer's leadership and also the position the Labour Party now finds itself in. Some of you eagle-eyed will have noticed that Deborah Matheson is not able to join us this evening. Again, you may be aware that she's just been appointed as head of strategy uh, to Keir Starmer. So understandably, she's rather busy and not able to join us. But as I say, we have um, a great um, group of um, speakers and respondents who are gonna discuss these issues with us. So I want to turn to our first speaker. I'm really delighted um, that Caroline Flynn is able to join us. Caroline, as many of you know, was a Labour Member of Parliament for the Don Valley from 1997 to 2019. She was one of 101 women uh, Labour MPs elected at the 1997 election, and she had um, a long record of distinguished service in the governments of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, and then joined the Shadow Cabinet in 2010, as well as standing to become deputy leader of the party. So she has immense experience of these questions, as well, of course, an understanding derived from her constituency. So, um, Caroline, it's great to have you with us and over to you. Sorry about that. My husband just shouted up the stairs, you're on mute. Um, I was just going to say that I've been in the Labour Party 43 years, so um, I joined in 1979. So I feel in some respects, I hope it's not the case, that I'm going through a sort of circle of membership of the Labour Party. But, you know, these recent years have been quite interesting to me reflecting back over those decades. Um, it's very interesting what Anthony said. I mean, it is clear that in many... Um, areas, Keir Starmer has improved on uh, the perception of the leader and contributed probably to the perception of the party. But I th don't think we should kid ourselves. It was from a very, very uh, low base to start with. And these elections, because obviously there were delays last year in, in 2020 because of the pandemic, are basically the largest set of elections that we're going to have before the general election. So I think, you know, Keir Starmer and his team would have been looking at this to judge about whether they were heading in the right direction. We know that publicly they were downplaying their hopes, but I think privately they never expected the results to be as bad as, uh, as they were. And, you know, of course, it's, of course it's welcome that we won the mayoralties in the west of England and Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, but it really can't make up for the losses elsewhere. And I think it does reveal, Patrick, uh, the deep hole that Labour's in. Um, and also that the voting patterns of 2019 have become more entrenched. I think many of my former colleagues uh, and others seem to think that that was going to be a blip and it would be, be it would bounce back, um, but that clearly has not been the, uh, the case. Um, I don't agree, uh, though, with some commentators that the loss of Labour's working class voters is somehow just an inevitable long term trend. I, I think bad politics, in many respects, has led to this uh, collapse. And uh, Anthony mentioned Rawlings and Thrasher in his contribution. They wrote on Sunday, for the second time in two years, Leave Voting England has delivered the Tories a stunning victory. Um, it wasn't inevitable. Um, it wasn't the only issue. And I'm not saying that another candidate would necessarily have won Hartlepool by any stretch. 
But I have to say, it, it takes something. And it must only be that Labour and some of the people around Keir Starmer thought that Brexit was such a dead issue, they decided to pick an ardent Remainer as a candidate in Hartlepool, uh, a 69% leave voting uh, seat. I don't think they're going to make the same mistake again with Batley and Spen, but <clears throat> let's see. Um, Labour's front bench, the party, they were warned throughout the 2017 Parliament that opposing Brexit and supporting a second referendum would be catastrophic, uh, but they ploughed on, leading to a, an electoral disaster. And I've been trying to think, and um, others, Robert might have some thoughts on this as well, I have been trying to think of another comparison where Labour put itself on the wrong side of our traditional Labour vote, and it reminded me, because I've been that long in the Labour Party, uh, of the early 1980s, uh, how the Labour Party opposed council house sales and lost 3.5 million voters uh, to Thatcher's Tories. And if you roll forward in 2019, the Labour Party lost millions of voters, very similar voters, to a pro-Brexit Tory party who pulled more votes than Labour in every social economic group, including the poorest. As I said at the time when I lost my seat, uh, the Corbyn faction blamed the, blamed the second referendum faction and vice versa when in truth um, both were responsible. But it was tough enough in 2017, I can assure everybody watching this, uh, the hostility was to Corbyn was there then, but and in majorities fell, including my own because of that. But in 2019, we were fighting on two flanks and that was very difficult. Back in the 80s, it took us uh, over a decade to win back many of those voters. And if Labour doesn't act quickly, we could guarantee another decade of Conservative government. So. You know, Starmer has been, as has been said already, he, um, he's made a start. Just replacing Cor Corbyn isn't going to be sufficient. He's regained control of the party machine. He acted on anti-Semitism and he eventually voted for a Brexit deal. And I publicly supported him on that because we have to move on. We can't keep refighting these issues. But I have to say there were plenty of voices inside the PLP and outside who berated him for that. Um, any leader would have been constrained by this lockdown. And, and we can't forget in all of this that, you know, taking nothing away from Ms. Keir Starmer's illustrious career, he's new to parliament. And for the wider public outside a, a pretty small catchment of people, he's really only defined by Brexit, by those who know of him. We found definitely in our polling in Doncaster, and I think Labour's wider telephone polling showed that in the last six months, Many voters could not even give him a score on how well he was doing because they just didn't know him enough. Um, and as for the vaccine bounce, I have since the vaccine started been a vaccination centre volunteer. And it's been great because I've had lots of conversations with people from all over Doncaster. And I can, uh, in my own polling there, if you like, not that the people who came for their vaccine realised I was polling them, really got that sense of, thank God we're getting the vaccine now. It's really great. Anybody who was in charge would have had a hard time. Um, we're just so looking forward to, to getting out of this lockdown situation. And, and Labour knew that, um, but seemed to feel that, you know, the messages they would be, give would be focused, particularly in the last six weeks, on cash for curtains and, uh, and James Dyson's uh, WhatsApps. It seems to me that um, uh, some of uh, Labour's people, like Ben Bradshaw, who argued on Thursday, uh, that where Labour governed well, it was rewarded in these elections, and it was punished where the Labour rot set in. I, I don't agree with that. I think where reward was given was often where particular electoral matters were present in terms of what was happening alongside those regional contests. But I also think, you know, it speaks to the fact that if you look at someone like Mark Drayford or Andy Burnham, or for that matter, Nicola Sturgeon or Ben Houchin in Tees Valley, two Labour, uh, uh, one SNP and one Tory, they have high profile, they're well known, they're very connected in many respects to their communities, and they all are all perceived as handling the pandemic well. And, and I suppose, again, that's the difference between being in politics and being in charge and able to do stuff because you're running things uh, and being in opposition. But in terms of Ben Bradshaw's theory, it doesn't explain at a council level uh, why Labour might be wiped out in Redditch or Harlow, why Peterborough elected just four councillors out of 23 in an area that had a Labour MP up to 2019, while Dudley had 14 Labour councillors up for election, returned just three. Labour has only five councillors out of 75 on Essex County Council. So where do we go from here and what can Starmer do? Look, I think they have to stop 
underestimating Boris Johnson and talking about nasty Tories. Um, I think in the, in the last parliament, 2017, 2019, lots of people underestimated the Tories, underestimated Boris Johnson about what he would do. At the end of the day, my view has always been is the Tories have this killer instinct. They want to win. They are hungry for power and they will want to win and they will change their and cut their cloth accordingly. And now we have a Tory party that is high spending, has lots to say, is cutting through and whatever Labour's you know, um, concerns about their language of levelling up, it is cutting through and they're finding ways in different ways to put money to those communities. Whether it's enough, that's a discussion. Whether it will have the impact we want it to have, but just knocking them and talking about um, their um, weaknesses isn't enough. And I have to say, going back to when I became an MP in 1997, I've noticed over a number of elections now since that time, the Tory front benches are changing. They're not as posh. I say that even though obviously the Prime Minister is an old Etonian. They, the new MPs are more working class. They have come from doing ordinary jobs. Uh, they live in the communities and they are much more engaged in some of the things, to be honest, a good hardworking constituency Labour MP would be involved in uh, than ever before. Second, we've got to stop insulting the voters. Uh, too many Labour commentators still regard voting Tory as beyond the pale. Six days ago, one journalist described the Tory party as evil and that voters had no excuse in voting for them. Well, you know, we've got to win these people back who voted Tory. So berating them for their choices doesn't really help. Third, and it's my point of view on this, and I'm sure others will disagree. We've got to find a way to atone or a way of apologising to leave voters. It's not about agreeing with them. But it's at least for saying we didn't show you enough respect and value that you had a point of view and we can show we have a plan about how we can work outside the EU to make Britain better. And I think that's really important because on Saturday I heard a Labour front bench who found it difficult to tell the BBC that Labour accepted Brexit and that's just not going to help us. We've got to be optimistic about Britain's future. Um, we've had years now where we basically sound like we are talking down Britain and talking down the potential of the people in Britain and about what we can achieve. Uh, we've got to talk ambitiously. I think we should talk about creating uh, jobs through manufacturing, a revival there. If we can make PPE and ventilators and produce vaccines, surely we could do a lot more about that. And in the past, I've talked about a muscular economic nationalism. Now, you know, whether that's in or outside the EU, let, let's take on board some of the ways we can use the leverage of government to make that more of a reality. Um, and I think if Labour is, is going to win the trust of those working class voters, we do need to understand them. We need, do need to share their aspirations and actually like them. Um, and then we can speak for them and sound not like we're talking down to them. And in that way, we've done it before. It's not easy. The challenge is hard. But somehow or another, you know, in those coalitions that won us elections in the past, we were able to take, you know, young people, graduates, middle class liberals with us because they believed in the Labour Party as the party that cared and was the party of social justice. But alongside that, we had some very pragmatic offers to those people for whom, you know, they haven't got the vantage point of lawyers in London. Um, they haven't got the vantage point of uh, riding out uh, uh, conservative governments that don't support their communities. We have to speak in the language they understand the things that they're concerned, concerned about. And that is about strong border, borders. It is about tackling crime. And it's more importantly about talking about their aspirations. Amplify that. And I think that would help us get back, further back onto the right track. Thank you so much, Caroline. I think a lot of food for thought there, and I'm sure um, what you've said has prompted lots of thoughts um, among the audience, lots of questions coming into the Q&A and chat function, keep them coming. I'm going to turn straight away to our second speaker, Eunice Goes. Um, Eunice is Professor of Politics at Richmond University. She has a number of areas of expertise. She's also written an excellent book, The Labour Party Under Ed Miliband, Trying But Failing to Renew Social Democracy. She might tell us now whether there are any parallels between Ed Miliband and Keir Starmer. But also, um, we're very keen to hear from Eunice because she has a perspective going across the whole landscape of European social democracy. And it might be interesting to reflect on 
how far Labour's problems structurally reflect problems that are afflicting other centre-left parties uh, across Europe. But Eunice, um, you have the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick, for that generous uh, introduction. And also thank you for the, the, the other panelists for uh, your great contributions, uh, learning already uh, uh, lots about what has happened uh, to labor. So um, I'll start by saying something about uh, Stama, what has happened, uh, why were these results so disappointing? And they were uh, disappointing despite uh, the progress that was registered uh, in uh, Cambridgeshire, Peterborough, uh, the, the metro mayors who saw their majorities increase, uh, and so on. Some, some progress that was also registered in, in the southeast, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, but we, what we also, what, I think what we saw here was also uh, the result of the strategy of Keir Starmer uh, in his first year of leadership, and that strategy did not uh, really work. So what does he try to do? He tried, uh, he tried essentially to show to voters that he was not Jeremy Corbyn. That was most, that was, I think, his main uh, priority. Uh, and so uh, he has invested in showing uh, that he is uh, competent, that he's ready to be uh, a, a prime minister, that is a forensic at the dispatch box. Uh, he has offered this uh, famous constructive uh, opposition, uh, which became a bit problematic because it was a constructive opposition that uh, was mostly uh, technocratic. It was not uh, on principles, it was not on values. Uh, it was uh, pretty much a technocratic uh, critique. Uh, he did not then offer very much in terms of uh, an alternative. It, did, it didn't have a narrative. It did not even have a set of policy offers that could enthuse uh, voters. Uh, what he did was a very bland, he offered a very bland message wrapped in a, a union jack, uh, the, talking um, a patriotic, it was a narrative that was patriotic, but, and there's nothing wrong with being patriotic, by the way, but there is a, there is a, patri a labor way of being patriotic, and uh, there is a, a, a way of being patriotic that touches upon more uh, uh, conservative uh, iconography, conservative uh, values uh, that speak not very much to, to labor voters, and in, in fact, can alienate uh, voters uh, in uh, cities traditional labor voters as well, who did not like all that uh, 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 allegiance or adoration for the monarchy or any, any or other flags. Um, there's even, well, uh, many analysts would say that it's not even a very British uh, thing, very English thing to wrap themselves, people to wrap themselves uh, in, the union, uh, in the union flag. English patriot or British patriotism used to be far more discreet and gentle uh, uh, and tolerant. And so that was somehow uh, uh, missed. As uh, Caroline said, uh, I think the context and, and, and Anthony, the context matters a great deal. Uh, this happened uh, during a pandemic. Uh, Starmer had very few chances to uh, showcase, to even meet uh, voters. He's been essentially leading the party through Zoom meetings. That's no, that's no way. This is essentially denying politics of its lifeblood. Uh, we are, the election also took place at a very inauspicious moment for Labour in the sense that we have not only a vaccine bounce, but the suspension of economic laws. Millions of workers are, have been furloughed. Uh, the lockdown Downs are being unleashed, so people are feeling, I wouldn't say happy or satisfied, but there is a sense of, you know, life is better than it was uh, a year ago. There is a sense of satisfaction with the status quo, uh, especially at a time of uncertainty. All of that mattered uh, for Labour's results. And I think the other underlying factor was, of course, the the realignment of British politics that has been happening, not in the last decade, it has been happening for several decades. Uh, the, the, the realignment of you know, the way that uh, the disappearance of the traditional uh, working class, the emergence of a far more diverse uh, working class, not just uh, industrial and white working class, but a different type uh, of working class. London has a very big uh, working class, but we don't talk about them. We, we, normally the conversation uh, about the working class tends to focus on the, 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 the old uh, heartlands. And so th th there's that dem demographic realignment. And also, I think there is the, the result of, and I think there hasn't been 
enough reflection about this, the way that the Labour Party abandoned these communities, not in the last 10 years, but 20 years. Uh, we, we've, we've heard of constituencies that hadn't been canvassed uh, in years. Uh, there is no presence uh, of uh, labor uh, activists. The trade unions, that was the other important aspect. The trade unions are, were gone. Uh, they left those heartlands. And if you read uh, Deborah Mastinson's book, uh, Beyond the Red Wall, uh, more than uh, the values, the, 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 the appeal to you, the prejudice, the description of the the prejudices of red wall voters i think what comes across there is the sense of neglect and abandonment that those communities feel how those places were left pretty much to perish so the, their sense of pride in their communities their sense of there are beautiful aspects uh, in their communities that need to be nurtured all of that uh, was abandoned and so when when places are neglected what remains is resentment, what remains is anger, uh, and those voters, I think, have been showing it uh, at least for the last, uh, in the last decade, five uh, elections, uh, four election defeats uh, that we've witnessed. So these factors uh, have contributed, I think, had a lot to say for the disappointing results, but also Starmer's defensiveness. And I would say that he has, he, he, he is behaving, to go back to what uh, Patrick was asking, he is committing some of the mistakes that Ed Miliband made uh, uh, during uh, his leadership in his defensiveness, uh, in uh, the fear that he has uh, of, of the media, the fear that he has of uh, uh, pr pr proposing something that it is more radical than he thinks that the voters uh, are ready uh, to accept. When the circumstances are very different, he has uh, he, he, he relies on far more support in the PLP uh, than Ed Miliband. He has a far more sympathetic media coverage than Ed, Mil Ed Miliband has ever had. And the context that surrounds him is also very, very different. When Milliband was leader, uh, austerity dominated completely all the conversations, all the policy conversations uh, in Britain. Now we are at a stage where uh, the, the, the paradigm has shifted. We have new winds are blowing in terms of political debates. So the discussion about uh, from levels, acceptable levels of taxation, the role of the state uh, uh, in society, uh, the role of trade unions unions as well, how uh, nefarious uh, inequality is for prosperity and so on. The debate has shifted. So there is a kind of a policy window for change. And this policy window, and I think this has been the mistake of Starmer, because he's been waiting for things to go wrong for the Conservative uh, uh, government. But they are not going badly for the Conservative government. So there's been the whole idea that, okay, so let's wait for uh, when the pandemic is controlled. But we've been one year uh, of uh, a pandemic and things are now going very well for the Conservatives. And Starmer cannot wait for a big recession or big unemployment to start to uh, uh, open up, to set up his stall uh, in terms of politics. So more, less defensiveness, I think a greater reading of the political climate and also an investment on uh, those areas and not appealing to people's uh, worst prejudices. There is this idea, as Carolina is saying, of the, there's a caricature of the red world voter, uh, socially conservative, uh, and, so, and the socially conservative has been perceived and presented as being uh, xenophobe, sexist, racist, and so on and so forth. I think this is the wrong strategy. To, to try to cater for those uh, prejudices. Uh, because Labour is not never going to win this battle. This is a, a battle that Labour would always lose uh, uh, against the Tories. Uh, the, the Tories would always propose more punitive approaches to immigration, refugees, uh, crime, uh, welfare, uh, people who, who are dependent on welfare. They will always have a, more, a much more punitive approach. And also that was not the way that the Tories won the Red Wall. They won the Red Wall by proposing massive public investment. So a, a collection of different strategies, I think, may lead uh, too much to somewhat better results, hopefully uh, a, a victory. Uh, but essentially, they, the, the, the defensiveness uh, and the fear of voters as well uh, needs, to, needs to change. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Enos. Again, a lot of um, food for thought, many ideas there that hopefully we'll get a chance to kind of chew over more in the discussion afterwards. I'm going to move on, though, straight away to our third panellist. We're really delighted to have Alba Ray here with us, who is political correspondent at The New Statesman and also co-host of The New Statesman podcast, which explores the latest developments in UK politics. And it's um, particularly useful to have Alva here with us because she's written extensively about Keir Starmer and the future of the Labour Party. I was listening to one of the New Statesman podcasts this morning um, and I have to say Alva did correctly predict the outcome of the Hartlepool by-election so you should trust what she has to say uh, but Alva over to you. Thank you very much Patrick and, and thank you um, for having me and, and for including me on this very esteemed panel. As you mentioned, um, this panel is so esteemed that Deborah Mattinson, one of the panelists who couldn't join us, is now Director of Strategy for the Labour Party, which is the level that we're talking. Um, I feel like that discussion was so wide ranging. It's, it's almost hard to know where to start, but I suppose um, as a journalist, someone who hasn't been an MP or in government and is not a pollster or an academic, I feel like I can probably add most value by trying to maybe first of all giving a sense of maybe what Keir Starmer is trying to do or thinks he's trying to do and then how well he has succeeded according to those um, um, targets that he set himself. So I suppose the the thing that he and his team have made very clear at least internally is that when he took over as leader the number one priority was to distinguish him from Jeremy Co to distinguish himself from Jeremy Corbyn as our panelists have, have all kind of acknowledged. And he did that very successfully. Um, saw an immediate bounce in terms of competence, um, in terms of, I think, scaring voters a bit less with a, a sort of an air of radicalism. And also really crucially, um, has spent a lot of her, his first year as leader tidying up the mess of, of Labour anti-Semitism, which has been a, a huge drag on Labour in terms of resources and energy. They're still struggling financially off the back of that and um, have had to appoint lots of people off the back of the EHRC report to, to implement the legally enforceable recommendations of that report. So I think it's sort of worth acknowledging that some of the work that he had to do has not really been public facing and it's been internal. And I think that in that I think they very much feel that a large part of their work um, as a Labour leadership is to clean up uh, the culture of the party internally, which, for which I think Keir Starmer gets very little credit, but that's definitely been going on. So they said that they they wanted to begin by um, by introducing Keir Starmer to the public favorably as competent and different to Jeremy Corbyn. And that then in 2021, they would begin to set out Keir Starmer's vision for um, the UK um, under a Labour government. And I think that that's when it started to fray slightly. Um, and you can see it in, in Anthony's numbers. I think that the, the crucial thing is that that also does coincide with um, the vaccine bounce. But even I think before that, at the very dark period before the second lockdown and before the third, when the when the government wasn't perceived to be doing so well, that's where we began to um, see a bit more of a public perception of, of Keir Starmer as an opportunist, because he, he didn't call for um, another lockdown until literally the sage minutes said that um, he should. It was not a very, um, it, it looked a little bit like a gamble, but it was the most predictable last minute gamble ever. And I think that that was the point where people began to think that um, it was this tricky, this tricky balance of trying to adopt a constructive approach to the pandemic, um, which started to look a little bit um, less, um, less convincing because um, it, it didn't seem like the, the Labour Party had a proper alternative um, thought through offer. They, they didn't really, like they've been just hoping to get through this unscathed and then to put it behind them and then make their case. But as it dragged on, they find it harder and harder to do that. So at the beginning of this year, we have seen some efforts to set out that vision. And I think there have been glimmers of, of what that looks like in terms of um, not so much um, who's better to deal with the pandemic, but who's better equipped to, to rebuild the UK after Brexit, I think that there's really a consensus um, in Keir Starmer's team that that's what the next election will be fought on, it's who can rebuild the UK better. 
they've been kind of trying to do that, but they have been drowned out because, as Anthony said, as um, they are they are up against a government that is just doing well at the moment. I think, regardless of um, of anything else, any of the sleaze allegations, ultimately the the main government program at the moment is one of the most successful in British history, and um, any um, any politician or government associated with that rollout is doing really well. So I think they've struggled on on all of those counts. Um, and the final thing to say on what they've been trying to do um, is that the, the best blueprint for this really is the Labour Together report after the 2019 general election, which sets out at least their, their idea for how they could build a winning electoral coalition. And it sets out this idea um, with, with certainly it sets out the problems, this, this long, this long standing um, trend of, of voters going to different places, decline a, in traditional heartlands and so on, and these cultural divides. Um, and basically it sets out this idea that when you're trying to unite sort of metropolitan younger voters in, in cities with um, more socially conservative voters in Labour's traditional heartlands, really what they're trying to do is to dial down those cultural differences and and then to dial up a radical economic offer that can unite everyone so everyone's concerned about the fact that young people can't buy a house um, older people are also concerned about that because they're concerned that their grandchildren can't do that and um, they're, they're concerned about whether whether work pays any more the high levels of insecure work basically this report sets out this idea that people are more united economically than they are culturally and that it's economically that labor can unite people that's kind of what Keir Starmer's team are trying to do um, I think so far we've seen that it's they're really struggling with that that actually the Conservatives love to pick culture war fights and the Labour Party really struggles to to dial that down in the way that they hope to. Um, and often they end up coming out with a quite mixed approach of the sort of the most radical voices from the left of the party setting the narrative because the Conservatives amplify those. Um, but then also other people in the party run away from those conversations and, and aren't willing to have the, the conversation. So on cultural issues, I think that you can already see that maybe the strategy isn't working. And then also economically, I think you've seen flashes from people like Rachel Reeves, who's now been promoted to Shadow Chancellor and who is really understood to have Keir Starmer's ear and who will be a really big influence in the strategy in the next few years. She has been um, championing, not just highlighting problems of um, outsourcing government contracts and patterns of sleaze and corruption but make, making an offer of, of radical insourcing and, and cleaning that up. I think we've seen sort of flashes of, of what a Labour Party would do differently but they're really, um, I think you know there are, there are real questions about whether that Labour Together strategy works at all um, but what we've seen with this reshuffle is that they are sticking to it gung-ho. They've brought more people in who worked on that report into the shadow cabinet that they are just going to be trying that approach even harder. Um, and then finally, I would just add, because, um, because of the past 48 hours that we've had, I would say that we've actually not had as clear an indication of what Keir Starmer is like as a leader than we've had over this period. Um, with the decision to hold that reshuffle um, and the way that that has unfolded. I think that lots of people in the Labour Party have had questions for a while about whether Keir Starmer has politics and also about whether, uh, <laughs> I can see Anthony, Anthony laughing, concerns about, about how, how much of a strategic mind he is and also whether the fact that, as Caroline mentioned, he doesn't have that much experience in Parliament or of politics, whether that would hinder him. And I think that the answer that lots of people in the Labour Party have had after the, you know, after this weekend is that he maybe doesn't have politics in the in the way that um, they they really thought. I think that there lots of people are worried about the advice that he's getting and about the um, the strategic instincts of of the Labour leader and the people around him because ultimately. As Anthony alluded to um, in his opening remarks, 
that labor doesn't need to be the protagonist of the, of this story um labor always makes itself the protagonist of british politics when actually at the moment the big story is scotland and the snp and the conservatives and keir starmer by holding a reshuffle at the point that he did has turned uh, you know, a disappointing set of results for Labour into a huge story of Labour crisis um, has really, I think, unsettled a lot of people in the party with that move to sack Angela Rayner, who has the same power base as him in the party. Um, he's really upset people with that. And he also hasn't listened to concerns about the advice that he's getting from his staff. He's taken criticisms of the people around him very personally. Um, rightly or wrongly um but he hasn't been willing to listen to those concerns so we're at a point where i think that his authority as a labor leader has been slightly diminished and he's you know he's brought in people who don't necessarily um someone like rachel reeves who um certainly has a lot of ambition and direction and verve but he is definitely to his right politically the fact that he's turning to her for um for direction, I think, is suggestive of, of the fact that he's le less sure what, what he's doing. So I think that um, this would have been a very different panel, I think, a week ago, um, or even at, in the wake of the results, but without that reshuffle. But I think that where we are now, I think that we're looking at a Labour leader who, who has definite strengths, the competence that, that the polling showed is very, very strong. Um, in terms of his image, but in terms of political strategy and corralling a team, um, I think he's he's never looked weaker, really. Alva, thanks again. You know, fascinating insights, I think, there into Keir Starmer's operation. I was also really struck by what you were saying about the Labour Together report, because it's a massive report. Those of you who've read it or seen it, um, I get the sense that it's been shelved somewhat, but it's really interesting what you were saying there about the fact that it's still to some degree driving Starmer's strategy. So perhaps we should all go back and look at that report. But thank you. And we'll definitely come back to you for some questions and comments mm -hmm. a little bit later. Let me, though, turn to our final speaker this evening. Uh, last but not least, by any means, uh, Dr. Robert Saunders. Uh, Rob is reader in modern British history at Queen Mary University of London, where he was also co-director of the Mile End Institute until very recently. Uh, Robert's a historian and political commentator who specialises both in the history of British politics and also the history of Britain's relationship with the European Union. His book, Yes to Europe, is definitely regarded as among the most authoritative accounts of the UK's decision to join the EEC in the 1970s. But he has a really wide ranging historical view. So, um, Rob, we're really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I'm not Deborah Mattinson, but uh, I'll try and offer a, a bit of a historical perspective on recent events. And as a historian, I think it's actually quite difficult to judge Keir Starmer's first year, because no previous leader of the opposition has ever had a first year like this. So we know that he inherited a very difficult hand for all the reasons that Alva has talked about. Since then, the COVID emergency has essentially shut down politics as normal. And the vaccine hasn't just been a popular policy, it's been a public policy success of a kind for which there isn't really a precedent, in that it reaches into almost every household in the country. Almost everyone either has been vaccinated, or their parents or their grandparents or their friends have been vaccinated, so it has a cut through that a tax cut or a spending rise or any other kind of policy success doesn't normally have. <coughs> So I think the challenge for the Labour Party at the moment is to try to separate out the signal from the noise. What is contingent and temporary about British politics, like perhaps the vaccine bounce, and what is structural and lasting? So if we try to put this in a longer perspective, I think it's fair to say that losing elections is not an unfamiliar experience for the Labour Party. Across the whole of the 20th century, Labour only won a decent working majority three times. In 1945, at the end of a world war, in 1966, when the whole country was on drugs, and in 1997, under Tony Blair. There are only two people who have been born since the Labour Party was founded 121 years ago, who have ever led it to an election victory. 1997 is the only time that Labour has won a decent majority from opposition. 
And even when it gets into power, it struggles to stay there. Before 2005, Labour had never served two full terms in office. Now, the reasons for that are partly out of its control. This is a party that has always struggled to match the Conservatives financially. It has always been grotesquely underrepresented in the press. It's also always been locked out of at least one part of the United Kingdom. Historically, that was the South of England. Now, of course, would add Scotland. But Labour also creates its own problems. Labour has always been riven with factional disputes, and it has always been intensely suspicious of its leaders. Even Clement Attlee, who is the nearest that the Labour Party has to a secular saint these days, faced, I think, at least three attempts to remove him from his job. One of them was on the day that he became prime minister in 1945. Neil Kinnock literally had fights in toilets at Labour Party conferences with members of Militant. So factionalism, again, isn't new. And because the Labour Party has always aspired to represent a particular cohort of the electorate, because Labour cares about who its voters are, it has always been vulnerable to the kind of social change and economic change that undermines its electoral base. So in the 1950s, it was the rise of the affluent worker, the kind of voter who owned a television and a car and increasingly thought of themselves as being middle class. In the 1980s, it was the decline of heavy industry, the collapse of trade union membership, the sale of council houses. All of those things seems to many in the party to be abolishing Labour's electoral base. And so because of all of that, the fear that Labour might never win again is also not new. As early as 1908, the Dockers leader Ben Tillett published a pamphlet called Is the Parliamentary Labour Party a Failure? In the 1950s, there was a, in 1960, I think, there was a hugely influential book called Must Labour Lose? In the 1990s, there was a whole genre of literature about Labour's southern discomforts and the rise of Mondeo Man. Now, in some ways, this is actually quite a hopeful memory, because in all of those cases, Labour did win again and won well. It built new electorates and it built new programmes. We all know that politics today is fantastically volatile. Nobody knows how the plates are going to move in the next few years. So Labour doesn't have a divine right to survive, but there is nothing inevitable about the Labour Party's decline. It does, though, have to face up to the scale of the challenge. And historically, it's been very slow to do that for reasons that we might perhaps come back to in the discussion. So what might Labour learn from its past? <clears throat> Well, firstly, whenever Labour has won, it has offered a positive and optimistic vision of the future and persuaded people that it can deliver it. So in 1945, that was the New Jerusalem, the modern Mecca of the welfare states. In the 1960s, it was Harold Wilson's scientific revolution, the idea of a country forged in the white heat of technology. In the 1990s, it was DREAM and Oasis and modernization and a new Britain. Now, putting a package like that together is, and making it convincing to the electorate isn't easy. It requires good storytelling, it requires clever policy work, and attention to mood. And I think the Labour Party is currently struggling with all three of those things. So on storytelling, Boris Johnson is a very good storyteller. He consistently connects Brexit, the vaccine success, levelling up, Freeport, Global Britain, every big policy announcement is plugged into that story. And he tells a very optimistic story about where Britain is going. Now, Labour may think that that story is bunkum, but it can't just be the Grim Reaper standing there with the scythe waiting for everything to go wrong. It has got to give people reason to hope for a Labour government. It's got to tell people what does it like about the country? What does it think is holding it back? Why should people actually want to work for a Labour government? Why will their lives be better if Labour is in power? And if Covid is going to usher in a more social democratic era, which is something that Keir Starmer has said on a number of occasions, Labour is going to have to shape how people understand and remember the Covid experience. So it needs to tell a story about why Britain was so unprepared for this about why it has hit different parts of the country 
so unequally. But it also, I think, needs to show how the best of this crisis speaks to labour values and how it offers a template that labour can build on. It's then got to attach that to some serious policy work. In the 1930s, the absolute nadir of Labour's electoral fortunes, it launched the most ambitious policy exercise in the party's history. And that really laid the foundations for the 1945 governments. In the 1990s, New Labour came out of a really serious attempt to rethink what the Labour Party was for in a world where the Cold War had ended, where Britain was moving to a new kind of service economy, where the male breadwinner model was breaking down, where things like gay rights and racial inequality were moving up the agenda. Now, people may not like the conclusions it reached, but the ambition of that project, I think, is very much needed again now. The Labour Party was founded at a moment when British politics was moving away from constitutional questions and towards questions of economics and distribution. If British politics is now moving back into a phase where constitutional questions and cultural questions are key, Labour is going to need some very serious rethinking. And then finally, and this is perhaps a naive hope, but Labour has got to find a way to manage its internal divisions. What it needs isn't unity, because when politicians call for unity, what they always mean is everyone should agree with me. But it needs to find a way to disagree fraternally, whether that is about Brexit or about any of the other questions that are dividing the party. And Labour really cannot survive the mood of constant outrage that dominates Labour Twitter. So fundamentally, Labour has to be serious about the scale of the challenge but also optimistic about its ability to meet it. Because if it fails to take that challenge seriously, it is going to lose again and again and again. And that will let down not just the Labour Party, but the people for whom Labour claims to exist. Thank you so much, Robert. Again, um, fantastic amount of really interesting points and analysis there that hopefully we will come back to and have a chance to discuss. So I'm going to come now to some questions that have been coming in. We've had lots of really um, brilliant questions coming in through the Q&A in the chat box. I'll try to get to some of these, I'll do my best, and I'll come to each member of the panel and ask them a specific question and get them to respond. So Caroline, I want to come to you first, if that's okay. There's a question here from Rob Waters. Caroline Flint presumably thinks that Labour's traditional vote has been taken for granted and lost as a result. As Labour turns to nationalism, muscular or otherwise, is there not now a risk that they will alienate the only vote that they appear to have left and that is keeping them afloat in many places. What's your response to that question, Caroline? No, no I don't agree with that. And, and I just, in, in answering this question, just pick up on something that Eunice said about, you know, the working class and who are they? Of course, there's working class across every community. And the definition is, is quite a wide one. But then to be honest, the definition of what is middle class is pretty wide as well. I would say that the middle class or those who might define themselves as middle class in somewhere like Doncaster, is very different to the middle class in Hampstead, to be honest, uh, in terms of the sort of jobs they're in, they own their own homes, but they're not the professional middle classes, more liberal middle classes that we see in our, in our city areas, in academia and, and the law and medicine and elsewhere. But, you know, there is a way in which to address mutual concerns. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm in danger of sounding very up, and I will say it, when, we had, when I was campaigning back in 1997 and the slogan was tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, that spoke to, if you like, a whole swathe of people from pretty much very different backgrounds, but really chimed in a way. Because, for example, you know, on, the door, on my doorsteps, and it's not just exclusively the doorsteps of places, you know, post-industrial places like Doncaster, I think in many communities, there is a real fear and concern about safety and crime that is as, is as evident today as it ever has been, to be honest. People want to feel safe in their communities. And they do want to feel uh, that those who are committing crimes, and often the largest volume of crime is in the poorest communities, I have to say, as well. Um, they do want to feel that we have good policing, that uh, things like antisocial behaviour are dealt with as well, because that's often the tipping point for other crimes that happen too in the community. But it also spoke to um, tough on the causes, which in many respects, for me as well, 
um, you know, talks to why do young people end up in crime? Why is crime intergenerational within families? What is going on there? And about better policing, but also a better justice system. So there's a really good example, Patrick, of where you can bring people together in a way that understands this. Education is another issue as well. Many of the middle classes take for granted education and uh, because either they can afford to pay for it in the private sector or they're in local areas where the housing is such that they're in these very good schools. But actually good education has a message across the class divide. For many families, I know in my own family, my younger brother and sister both left school at 60. My brother is a father of two boys. They have gone on further in education than he ever did. Uh, and his first mm -hmm. son has gone to university. They have aspirations. So there are these opportunities. But if you have a big issue, as I said, like council house sales or Brexit, come along, it basically really forces a situation where actually and um, these divides become ever more, um, if you like, extreme but also damaging to that sense that we can bring these two communities together. But it is not inevitable that that has to be the way, but there has to be a certain more, too much of our party has been, I think, dominated by those for, if you like, on the middle class liberal side, rather than attempting to engage with those from working class communities. And don't forget in London, I was canvassing for uh, Sadiq when, in 2016, as well as obviously uh, you know, we've come in the, Euro, uh, the referendum. I spoke to many people from the poorer parts of London, both white and from the BAME community, who were voting for Sadiq, but were voting Leave. 40% of Londoners voted Leave. Um, and the truth is the Remainers, and I was one of them, thought that probably the London percentage of voting for Remain would be higher, and that would tilt the balance nationally at the end of the day, and it didn't work. So I am not complacent about just a certain working class voice in my constituency. Uh, and elsewhere. I'm conscious of it on a much wider level across the country that we're losing traction with. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to turn to a question now for Eunice from Joshua. So Joshua's question is, does Keir Starmer need to sacrifice party unity and the support of social liberals to win back lost votes and ultimately win a general election? I have a sense of how you might respond to this, Eunice, but what are your comments on this question? Well, thank you. No, I don't think he has. Uh, I don't think he has to sacrifice. I think the the difficulty for Starmer, and this has been the difficulty for um, previous Labour leaders, at least for the last decade, is to try to find. It's kind of it's been the holy the quest for the holy grail for Labour politics of trying to have to have a, a, a coalition, an electoral coalition that encompasses. Uh, the the voters in in labor's traditional heartlands and uh, the, the 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 urban voters, because labor cannot win an election uh, I only with with the voters from the cities. Uh, no, there's no way that Labour can form a government with uh, young progressive voters from uh, university towns uh, uh, and cities, nor can Labour rely only on, uh, on the heartlands or suburban voters uh, or voters from uh, post-industrial areas. It really needs to build that uh, coalition of voters. The difficulty is finding the right combination. And you know, what, what are the issues that you are going to emphasize? And the difficulty has been that one. Because if you, if you, are, if you go too high, if you, if you are really dialing up on uh, staunch uh, uh, patriotism, uh, silence, being silenced on questions of race, so the issue or tuition fees uh, or a whole agenda that caters for red wall voters, you are going to alienate those younger pro progressive voters. But you also, if you are, if your agenda is only about free tuition fees, uh, anti-racist campaigns, and so on, you are going to alienate the voters uh, in, the, in the red wall. And we're not even talking about Scotland. Uh, Scotland is already, we're already discussing Scotland uh, as it's something that it's lost for a very long time uh, for the Labour Party. So the difficulty is in finding the right alchemy, you know, the different elements. Uh, Alba mentioned that the, the, the strategy has been to try to find sufficient common uh, economic issues that might bring together those different, the, the, those different uh, 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 voters. Uh, Robert also mentioned the optimistic message. And I think this is where Labour needs also to go. Uh, it needs to, 
to, to, to look forward, uh, it needs also to promise concrete things. It needs to look at, and, and it also needs to demonstrate that it can do the, can improve people's lives. Uh, so building on, on, uh, on the experiences of where labor is in power uh, in Manchester, in, uh, in, in Preston, in Salford, uh, in many other places. So I think Starman really needs, he, can, he, he should not give up uh, on a, a, a group of voters. He needs to try to build that coalition, bits of them, maybe not all of them, but bits of it that will eventually will, will result in a winning uh, a, a coalition of voters. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn now to Alva. There's a couple of questions in the chat and Q&A about whether or not some of the more senior members of the PLP, figures such as Yvette Cooper, Hilary Benn, could be expected to return to the shadow cabinet in the foreseeable future. Alva, you've got your finger on the pulse of the PLP and the Starmer leadership team. Um, what's your sense of that question? Are we likely to see further personnel changes at the top of the party? What do you think? Um, so in answer to the question about further personnel changes, I think that what you can see from this sort of reshuffle that we had over the weekend are the sort of the shadows of the reshuffle that might have been had Keir Starmer felt a bit more emboldened. So for example, the way that Wes Streeting is now Shadow Secretary of State for Child Poverty, um, obviously a, a department that doesn't exist. Um, he's clearly, I, I don't think it's rude to say that clearly a more ambitious or emboldened Labour leader was maybe planning to demote Kate Green as Education Secretary and Wes Streeting would have got that promotion. He still wanted to promote him, but he didn't feel brave enough to sack her. And I think that there are a couple of patterns like that. So you can kind of see the, um, the shape of what a more, of, of what a slightly bolder reshuffle would have looked like. In terms of Yvette Cooper and Hilary Benn, my honest answer is I think that there was no chance of, Hil of Yvette Cooper coming back into the shadow cabinet and for Hilary Benn it was very unlikely too, mainly because I think that Keir Starmer's view is that he really needs strong Labour figures as select committee chairs. They have a really important role to play in scrutinising the government. I think even if perhaps the public doesn't see that work that goes on, it does trickle through. Um, it's, you know, government humiliations in select committees do really shape the narrative around certain things or expose certain things. And I think the idea that Yvette Cooper would leave that role as chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee and that vacancy would be open to any Labour figure, um, potentially, you know, a 2019 or, or a relatively inexperienced person, I think is, is not something that he would have wanted to do. And that applies to other select committee chairs who are, who are very talented as well. Someone like Meg Hillier um, is, is very talented, but I think she'll, she'll always stay where she is. Um, similarly with, with Hilary Benn, I think there's, there's a tendency to talk about him as, as a big beast because he was Shadow Foreign Secretary for a while. But I think that there, there isn't really much of a sense of, of, of a desire to bring him back. But I think that what was interesting about that is that those were briefed in the, you know, in the same round of briefings as as Rachel Reeves being promoted, which which did happen. So I think that um, there were there were maybe some interesting, um, maybe some people on the right of the party were particularly keen to see even more people from the right of the party ascend, um, but that didn't happen, and I think it's quite unlikely to. That's great. Thank you for that really valuable insight. Well, I'm going to turn to you now. There are several questions that have come up in the Q&A about the issue of a progressive alliance. Should Labour in some sense seek a compact or an agreement with other parties in order to stand a chance of gaining a majority at the next election? And there's a specific question here from John Brotherton. I'll just read it out quickly. Despite all the issues highlighted by the panel, the Tories only managed 36% of the vote. Isn't it time there was an anti-Tory alliance to be followed by a fair proportional voting system? Given your sense of the history around this progressive alliance question, what's your response to that? Well, speaking personally, I would, I think first past the post is a deplorable system and I would much rather that we had a more proportionate one. But I think that Labour has to be careful not to delude itself, that there is some magic route back to power, um, because I think that rests on a number of misapprehensions. One of them is the idea that anybody who doesn't vote for the Tory party 
or for UKIP, the Brexit party, is a progressive voter who just doesn't know which party they ought to vote for. And that if you took away the option of voting Lib Dem or voting Labour in a particular place, then they would all do the sensible thing and rally around the anti-Tory candidate. There's very little historical or psychological evidence for that. I mean, Anthony can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that misunderstands what Lib Dems are voting for or what Greens are voting for when they're not voting Labour and vice versa. I also actually think that there is a problem, that there is a kind of democratic problem here, which is that Labour is in danger of saying these wretched voters just don't know how to vote tactically and that we keep telling them what to do and they're cussedly not doing it. So we're not going to let them vote Lib Dem next time. Or we're not going to let them vote Labour in a Lib Dem seat so that they can't make the same mistake again. And given that one of the cultural problems perceived with the Labour Party at the moment is that it talks at voters rather than talking with them, I think that plays into that idea. Yeah, that's, I think, a really important set of reflections that we would need to think about um, around the issue of um, Labour forming arrangements with other parties. Anthony, I wanted to just turn to you briefly. There are several queries that have come up about this issue of exactly how Brexit has impacted on Labour support. A question about the effect that it had in the 2019 general election, the sense that Labour was perhaps falling between two school stools on Brexit. Was it, in fact, a Remain party or a clearly it wasn't regarded as a leave party but it was seen as having an unclear position from what you've seen obviously having looked at the polls extensively over the last few years what's your sense of the room for maneuver that Labour has on the issue of Brexit and where it needs to get to if it's going to be more successful than it was over the last few days of elections um well the easier half is probably moving forward because it is it is probably now more widely accepted that it is pointless to refight that battle and so it is that it gets to the point where Labour just has to acknowledge this move on and go to other issues and the, the other question I saw back in in the chat is the you know what could Labour have done differently was there a better solution that they could have done that wouldn't have cost them all that support and I saw some describe it as that you know, that thing in Star Trek where they've got that completely unwinnable scenario that's just test done their attitude to test their attitude to failure. And I think it was, there wasn't anything that, I don't think there was anything at all that Labour could have done that wouldn't have been a disaster for them in the wake of Brexit. Because there was a big, there was a huge chunk of um, um, Labour activists and Labour parliamentarians who were incredibly angry and wouldn't have gone along with a, oh, we're going to embrace Brexit. Um, uh, it, it is a perhaps a, there's almost a fantasy scenario of the Labour Party as a whole saying, oh yeah, we're, we're back Brexit because you can look through the Parliamentary Labour Party and think, no, they would never have done that. They would never have done that. They would never have done that. We had a small and essentially doomed to failure split, but how much bigger would that split have been if Labour had endorsed Brexit? I don't think there was. Jeremy Corbyn tried for a while early to sit on that fence and try and keep both, both halves happy. And it, it didn't work. And he got eventually got bumped into backing a second referendum. Um, um, I, we can't go back and test alternative versions of reality, but I can't see an alternative version of reality that would have been all fine for Labour. I think they just got dealt a hand that was fatal to them. The worst thing it did, I think, was the effect on the on the so-called red wall seats and so on and so forth. Those are demographic changes that were happening anyway, as Caroline said in her, at the start, but it brought it forward like that and just slammed it down and made it happen now straight away. And the problem for Labour now is that there's similar demographic changes in the South as more educated young people move towards Labour in traditional Tory seats but there's not some big, great change in politics that make that happen overnight. That alternative um, um, voter base is going to take decades to develop. And so Labour is stuck between that one that's been ripped away from them in a, in a hurry and one that's going to take years to build up. Yeah, it's really interesting what you're saying there, Anthony, because I think out of the results in the last few days, there's a sense that out of some very poor performances, there are some kind of green shoots for Labour because it does seem to be doing better in some of the Southern English local authorities in particular. But from what you were saying just then, you don't expect the social changes associated with that um, 
improved performance to translate into a significant improvement in Labour's position in southern England for some time to come. Exactly. Most of the time, changes are slow and gradual over, over election, over multiple elections. But Brexit just made them happen like that overnight. And nothing else is going to do that for Labour. OK, thank you. So I'm going to give time now to each member of the panel for some final reflections. I'm going to put two questions to each of you that I'd like you to think about, if that's OK. The first question is from Rowan McWilliam, um, who says, great comments from all speakers. Agree with that. Um, but no one has pointed out that Labour's problems are part of a global crisis. Left wing parties across the world are in trouble. Obviously, Labour might want to look to Biden's success. There's a danger of being parochial in these discussions. I think that's a really important comment. Um, there's another comment that's come up in the chat from Anthony. Labour as a brand and Labour activists, especially on social media, appear to hate voters. Voters are stupid. That seems to be the attitude. How would members of the panel respond to that issue as well? So I'm going to go in reverse order. Robert, let me come to you first. What are your thoughts on those questions and indeed any other final comments that you might want to make? <coughs> Sorry, was that me? I was too busy coughing. It was you, Robert, if that's okay. Could I have a moment? Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, you're coughing. Okay. <laughs> Um, let me come then to Alva. Alva, what are your thoughts on those issues? I think there is a, a big issue for Labour on Twitter. I'm not sure how they resolve it. Um, one of, actually, I think Keir Starmer's strengths is that he is very offline. Um, he's like never really taken much of an interest in criticisms of him on Twitter, which I think is probably right. Um, but it does just um, put divisions um, really out in the open. I think um, the parochial one is a tricky one as a Westminster journalist because I make no apology for the fact that in my day-to-day -day job I'm very much just focused on um, British politics. I suppose the, the thing is that within a parochial lens we have been very focused on how Labour is doing in England and we haven't so much touched on actually Labour's successes in Wales at this election and I think that there are some interesting lessons there because we talk about the, the Red Wall in a quite abstracted way but in, in 2019 the Red Wall included seats in Wales that went that voted Conservative after a very long time of voting Labour leave voting seats and in this election they they didn't follow that trend they stuck with Labour mostly or even that Brexit party vote didn't all go Conservative a lot of it went to Labour um, so it, it just proves what Caroline says that I think that these trends are not inevitable um, and if I if I might just this is slightly off piste but we we were talking about um, Hartlepool there briefly and I think that there are some lessons there to learn I think it's really difficult um, even though it's the name of the game it's really difficult thinking in the abstract about these kinds of voters and what they want and how you message to them I think if you look at the fight in Hartlepool it's really clear that Labour did not fight a good campaign there and I think in the context of the Brexit bounce um, it's very likely that Labour couldn't have won there anyway in this political context. And it doesn't mean that it wouldn't have won it, you know, in a few, few years down the line, maybe that seat would be winnable for Labour. But the, the interesting thing from the result there is the, the person who came third place, Sam Lee, a, an independent candidate, she's a local businesswoman and, and a young mom. Um, she took 10% of the vote directly off Labour. And if they had got that, they would still have lost, um, but they maybe wouldn't have lost if there hadn't been the vaccine bounce. And I think that basically Sam Lee's candidacy is the embodiment of everything Labour did wrong in Hartlepool. That um, I think that Caroline kind of touched on this, that I think voters in Hartlepool did feel quite patronised by this idea that you could, and Patrick will have heard me say this on the podcast as well, I think voters did feel patronised by this idea that someone who had been a, a pro um, people's vote campaigner in another seat, um, that someone else's, some, another constituency's unwanted MP basically was um, being sold to them and that, that he was a remainer. And I think that um, I don't, I'm not actually sure if Brexit would have come up in the same way if there had been a more anonymous candidate, someone local who just sort of 
knew Hartlepool and knew the potential of the place, loved the place. Um, I think that it was the fact that I think um, that there was something a little bit brazen about standing someone with such an obvious pro-Remain record in Parliament. Um, I think what that was saying about Labour and what they thought Hartlepool voters would and wouldn't stand for was really clear. Also, the candidate, Paul Williams, uh, uh, there were some issues with him in terms of how he hadn't scrubbed his social media before he stood and so on. But he himself has said that Labour didn't have a good enough message there. And my experience being there was that Labour was doing a lot of apologising and not very much explaining the, the, the very obvious decline in Hartlepool, the closure of the magistrate's court, the closure of police cells in the town, um, other, other various closures were the result of, of either direct decisions taken in Westminster, such as the closure of that court, that's a direct Ministry of Justice decision by the Conservatives, or the, you know, the trickle down effect of Conservative cuts. I really felt like that message was not cutting through. And I think poor Paul Williams, the Labour candidate, um, I think when I, when I interviewed him briefly, he said that Labour was listening maybe 10 times mm -hmm. and never really, I think in the time that I was speaking to him, explained that that actually he had a he had a message back for voters that that it wasn't necessarily all labor's fault even though there's been a labor mp there and a labor councillor there so i think that um it, it can be really difficult with these questions to think about the kind of messages that that would or wouldn't work but my really overwhelming feeling in hartlepool was that maybe Labour wouldn't have won there anyway because of the, the current polling situation and how well the government is doing. But I don't think that these questions about how you target this kind of slightly fetishized voter necessarily need to be that complicated. I think definitely voters do not want to be patronized and they want a really clear message and, and, and there needs to be some quite clear communication, but a, a better campaign in Hartlepool would have gone a long way without thinking, um, in such an abstracted way. There are really, really clear lessons that they can learn from that for a start and, and they'll be able to implement those in Batley and Spen quite soon. Indeed, that's one to look forward to if you're uh, a keen uh, follower of by-elections, the forthcoming by-election in Batley and Spen. Eunice, let me turn to you. You might want to reflect particularly on that question about parochialism, but you also might, may have thoughts about labour and social media. So any final comments from you? Well, Labour finds itself in a very similar position to other uh, social democratic parties in Europe, but there is also huge diversity uh, across Europe. The, the left is doing relatively well in Southern Europe, uh, practically inexistent in France, is doing relatively okay in Scandinavia, uh, uh, out of, of, of power in Greece. So it's, it's a, a very diverse uh, picture, but we can find there are similar challenges to the ones that Labour finds. One is the combination Nation, and this is a kind of a really toxic combination of huge constraints in the ability to decide on your economic policy. So social democratic parties and governments in Europe are usually constrained about the kind of economic policies they can put in place because they need to comply with the convergence criteria, all the governance rules of the monetary union. And this has been a huge problem uh, for social democratic parties. The other problem is, of course, uh, the, the whole populist wave uh, that is hitting Europe. Uh, and this has been going on for a very long time. In France, since the 1980s, that France and uh, uh, Marine Le Pen, the, the, the National Front has been eating away first votes to, from the, the Communist Party, then to the Socialist Party. In Austria, it's been, that has been a problem. In Germany, we see the Social Democrats uh, being completely uh, uh, almost eliminated by uh, the effects of being in a coalition with the Christian Democrats for uh, over uh, a decade. All of that in so we have local aspects, but in one, in, in one hand, the inability to address this concern, the cultural concerns on national identities and anxiety but, uh, th that voters feel. But th those anxieties on matters of values are connected and cannot be disentangled from uh, two decades of rising inequality, rising social uh, economic insecurity, job insecurity, the sense that life is precarious uh, and difficult. People become far more attached and more fearful 
of strangers, of foreigners, of migrants, uh, of people who look different when their uh, life conditions are not secure. I think this is, this is essentially the lesson. And at, uh, labor has one advantage. Uh, labor is not constrained by the European Central Bank or the Eurogroup, uh, if labor would be in, 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 in government, in terms of what kinds of things it can do to, it, to its budget. So this being out of the, the European Union gives actually a bit of room for maneuver uh, for a, a labor government to decide, you know, on an ambitious uh, economic program. There's other difficulties, economic difficulties of being out of the European Union. We're not discussing Brexit, uh, but th that that leeway, that macroeconomic leeway, it's not something that uh, a labor should neglect. And that has been the big problem for social democrats uh, across Europe, especially those who are part of the Eurozone. On the question on the, of the social media, I'm afraid I don't really have an answer. Uh, I only agree, I can only agree that this has been, it's, it's very toxic. Uh, it, it leads to um, uh, very uh, navel gazing discussions between different factions of the Labour Party. But the big problem is that uh, these discussions then filter through because they are connected with mainstream media because uh, Westminster journalists are also on social media participating in those discussions and so on and then those discussions are reflected in the media coverage and so what comes out of that is that labor voters and labor activists and, and that's the big difficulty in the, the difficulty of disentangling uh, an activist or supporter of the labor party for somebody who's actually a member of the labor party a councillor of the Labour Party, a Labour MP. Uh, so if somebody says something terrible, uh, ter terrible uh, about voters uh, on social media, it's essentially the whole Labour Party that is, is, that is considered uh, responsible uh, for that outburst. Uh, but I, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I, I can only say that it is hugely problematic. And if somebody has an idea on how to address that, uh, it should come forward uh, and present it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Robert, apologies if I made you choke earlier, but what are your final thoughts, reflections on those questions and any other thoughts that you might have? Yeah, sorry, I've come back to life again. Um, on, Very on relieved. The point, on, on the point about hatred, I think it's a really important one. I think Labour often gives the impression that it hates itself, its current leader, all of its former leaders, the voters, the old voters of this has lost and the new voters that has gained. And then it turns around to the country and says, why don't you love us? And that's a really difficult place for a party to be. And I think if there's one, one, one message I'd want to give the Labour Party, I think it needs, to, it needs to recapture its faith in ordinary people. It often talks about Brexit voters or Red Wall voters as if they're a kind of alien species and that they're terrible people and that the Labour Party has to make a decision between either pandering to their prejudices or shaking their dust off its feet and looking elsewhere for support. And it forgets that there is a reason why these people were Labour voters for a long time, that they are, they want the same things that everybody else wants, that they want, they care about good education, they want a better future for their kids, they care about poverty and local economic issues, and that it, Labour has to kind of recapture a sense that these voters can be won for a vision of politics that Labour regards as good, and indeed that the Labour Party itself can learn from those voters about what a good politics should be. So it needs to rebuild its faith in the electorate, it needs to get better at talking with the electorate rather than simply talking to the electorate, and as I think Raphael Baer said the other day, to stop treating elections as moral tests that the section of the electorate keeps inexplicably failing. Thank you very much. Anthony, I'm going to come to you as the penultimate contributor. You might may have reflections on those other questions. I also wanted to ask you very quickly about Scotland, which we haven't touched on. Um, from your perspective, what did you make of the Scottish elections in terms of Labour's position? Again, is there anything there to be optimistic about or are we still is Labour still bumping along the bottom as far as its support is concerned in Scotland? Okay, let's start with I'll start with Scotland first, since um, um, there's there's not much. In, I mean, having started my introduction with trying to be in, in trying to interject some <laughs> reason for Labour and some positives, I'm afraid all my answers here are going to be unremittingly negative. Um, um, 
Scotland, no. Um, Anna Sarwal's approval ratings as a new leader are very good. Other than that, um, uh, no. I mean, Labour, when Labour did well, it's because unionist voters were prepared to vote tactically against to minimise the amount of um, um, pro-independence MSPs. Um, um, and that that will keep Labour with a block of people where the, be where the best where they are the best placed union is party to win, but it's not a route to them getting anywhere near back to their old position of dominance in Scotland. So they need to get support and MPs somewhere else if they're ever going to make up for that block of MPs that they've probably permanently lost to the SNP, or at least they've lost for as long as the independence issue remains dominant in Scotland. Um, um, moving on to the other ones, the, the sort of hatred and the social media thing. Um, it's, in one sense, it's a huge, there's, there is a thing of strength there for Labour because people on social media are much younger and people on the left are much, much more willing to put their hearts on the sleeve and display political messages and share political messages. When we went, I think it was the 2017 election, we asked people what they'd seen on social media and people who reported and how they'd seen it more importantly. And people who saw Tory messages on social media was because the Tory party had paid for lots of adverts on Facebook. And people who saw Labour messages on social media was because their friends and people they trust had shared them and amplified that message. And that should be a huge strength for Labour, except they don't have said share the messages that Labour necessarily want them to share. They share all the, I'll never kiss a Tory, how dare you vote for those, you're all evil and you're wrong and you're bad. One of the things that got Tony Blair elected and got new Labour elected was message discipline. And Picking those messages, like Caroline said, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. That's an excellently crafted message. If you can get all your supporters echoing things like that, you're away. But Labour have got a huge crowd of incredibly enthusiastic supporters on social media who won't give the messages that Labour want. And I don't think there's any way of corralling all those cats to serve Labour's purposes. So I think something that should be a strength is going to continue actually being a weakness for them. Thank you. Um, Caroline, last but not least, what are your final reflections? Golly, there's a lot um, that has sparked a whole lot of other discussion. Uh, social media, I wish we could put Labour controls on it. Um, you know, uh, because the thing is, I think if we'd had in 97, the sort of social media have we have today, where, you know, constantly people are, are, are putting points of view across, which is, you know, that's fine, that's their point of view. But every time it's done, and Anthony, I think you're referring to what we create is an echo chamber, right? It is with no, it is, you know, it is with no sort of sort of pause button on it. And therefore we are laying out often our dirty linen in front of everybody, but also it gets reported on by all those political journalists. And as others have said, you know, they're not all pro labor, surprisingly. And it just reinforces an image of us in our party that in some ways we didn't have to worry about that back in 97. And let me just be clear, look, what happened, it seemed to me as part of the journey from 1980, well, 1979, but certainly from 83 all the way up to 97 was partly the Labour Party that had a huge number of people in it who have had as left wing views as those in the party today. Um, many of whom did not necessarily want Tony Blair to be Prime Minister or leader of the Labour Party. Um, but actually, they got sick of losing. They just got sick of losing. And to be honest, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> we need more of that. We need more of that in the Labour movement for crying out loud. Um, and in some ways, you know, clearly people were able to sort of say, right, well, you know, we've just got to get on and, and do stuff. We need to speak to a wider community outside of our own echo chamber to really tap into where people were. We've got to craft messages that in some ways have a resonance, you know, in different parts of the country within different uh, groups uh, and, and but still have a positive resonance. That's the important thing, a positive resonance at the end of the day. And if you just have, which I think, you know, became even more stark in, in the Corbyn years, where all our messages, you know, are to the bottom 10%. Is there anything wrong with that? No, of course, on one level of no, of course, we should be doing something for the poorest in our society, for those who have had, got the least advantages in society. But to do something 
you have to have a message for the people for whom that is not their priority every day. So they vote for Labour so we can get into power to do something about it. And that is what's been missing. And it, it goes back, I think, as well to, and I think this is the other issue about, you know, elections and, and voters. We can't expect voters to be grateful for what we've done in the past, no matter how great that was. But it's made even worse when from 2010 onwards, there was an active move to disparage the last Labour government, but also to sort of almost put a stop on talking about some of the good things that Labour government did from 1997 onwards. Not that it was perfect. One of my favourite uh, um, uh, phrases, I suppose, is that there's no such thing as a perfect Labour government, but it's better than a Conservative Labour government, you know. I think that's the thing. I'm a cup half full person, not half empty when it comes to the Labour Party. You know, I've seen over many years, I've had to suck things up in the Labour Party, uh, particularly as a woman, um, to because actually we've got to get people to work together and choose my moments in which to have some of my battles, basically. Now, I'm not saying that everyone should do that, but we have got a problem in the Labour Party that we spend too much time trying to basically please all the different groups in the Labour Party, the unions, the affiliates and everybody else. And fundamentally, we spend the least amount of time talking about how do we please the wider uh, electorate out there. And one thing about America and Biden is that he was the right candidate at the right time. But despite all those you know, people in, uh, within the Democrats who are way le more left wing than Biden, he made his message about those Rust Belt voters that they need to win back. Did that mean that socially progressive liberals did not vote Democrat? No, it didn't. They did in droves. But he also managed to get back those Rust Belt voters because he knew that that was the priority for who should be listening to the message of the Democrats in that election. And, and that's something we have to deal with within Labour. I don't have any sense, and I didn't have this over the referendum and Brexit, that the danger was losing uh, progressives uh, away from Labour. Because if the choice is between the Conservatives and Labour, and Labour is the only party that can make an impact and win, then that's where we can take some of those people with us. But if you turn down the volume to those people we need to win, and I'm, I'm sorry that Deborah's not here because I have two questions for her tonight. One is I, I question the definition of the Red Wall. There are 24 seats in the so-called Red Wall that have never been anything but Labour. But Darlington, which she went to, had a Tory MP for many years. There are other seats that had Tory MPs. We had to win them back. The Labour seat. So actually, our problem is Labour in many respects. I mean, Scotland is another issue there, but it's not about necessarily even the Don Valleys um, or the Rother Valleys. It's about those seats that are went Tory in 2010 or went Tory in 2015 and in Mansfield. And as we've seen up in Teesside, in fact, my husband should have been the candidate <laughs> for, for Hartlepool. He went to uh, um, uh, English Martyrs Comp there um and but in t you know in those areas um it's winning those seats that have been Tory now for some time that we won in 97 and then we lost 2010 2015 2017 and those Tories like Ben Houchen and the guy in Mansfield have doubled their majorities they are getting bigger majorities it's not going the other way uh, and that's what we've got to think about and nobody nobody is going to win an election where you spend your whole time basically having a go in a, a pretty nasty way. And look, I'm, I think there are occasions where you have to be hardball about things and hold your, the, uh, the Tories to account. But the nature of the language in it, which is particularly prevalent on social media, is almost an indirect insult to anybody who's voted for a Conservative. Well, why on hell should they vote for Labour if they feel that every time um, that it comes up. They're either called stupid, racist, or, or, or something else. And that is the feedback that you get on these things uh, from the doorstep, is from people saying, I don't think the Labour Party uh, values me. I think they just think I'm stupid and I'm racist. Uh, and I'm talking about white working class or white working class middle class, because lots of these people own their own homes in places like Doncaster and uh, Darlington and other places, and they want more out of life and opportunities for themselves and their children. 
So therein is is the discussion. And I just wish, and I'm looking at you know the comments in 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 the in the box. I've tried to answer a few. Is I just wish the party would spend more time actually talking about some of the polling that Anthony uh, has presented this evening or polling that's more local to their areas and compare what they're talking about in the GC <laughs> amongst the membership and what they think the priorities are and have some polling to counter that about what actually the public think um, are thinking of us. I think it'd be a bloody good exercise for the Labour Party to do more of that, to you know just engage, be seen to engage. Um, and, and it's not just in the North and the Midlands, but throughout the country um, where we're based. And, and a bit more of that and a bit less talking about PR and other things uh, wouldn't go amiss. We, the Labour Party, when we lose elections, uh, we have about two days where we all get riled up about it. And then it's a bit like a hangover. We get over it and then we go back to uh, normal behaviour, which often isn't helpful towards us winning back votes and winning elections. So um, take your Alka-Seltzer. Uh, but um, to keep having the conversation and be open to others' point of view, and that might help. Okay, well, thanks. Lots of powerful points from the panel there. Lots of issues that we could have discussed. I'm reminded by my colleague, Lindsay Jenkins, we haven't discussed Wales, where, of course, Labour did very well. We haven't talked about the successes of Wales. Perhaps we can discuss that at a future MEI event. I just want to say, in conclusion, we've run a little bit over time, I know, but it was a really valuable discussion um, but I want to say thank you to all of our panellists, Caroline Flint, Eunice Goes, Alva Ray, Robert Saunders and Anthony Wells, and thanks to everyone who's posted questions and to all of you for coming this evening. Do sign up to our mailing list, subscribe to the MEI podcast. You can find recordings of all our previous events on our website. Thanks for taking part in the conversation. It's been great to have you with us, and we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Have a good evening. Thank you.